Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Run. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being with us today. I have Russell Heath with us today. Uh, listen, Russell is a novel novelist. He wrote a great novel, but he was also formerly a lobbyist. And you know what politics done right? That is all we do, all we talk about. Russell Heath, welcome aboard. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Well, look, uh, first of all, before we get into the politics, before we get into the books, did I read something about you that you jumped on a boat and, and ran around the world on a boat almost by yourself? Sailed, actually. I didn't do much running. Yeah, well, the, uh, <laughs> I had this beautiful little boat. I, if I'd known we were going to be video, I'd show you a, a picture of it. But it's a 25-foot wooden boat, classic wooden boat designed in the 30s. And um, I sailed her from Alaska all the way down to Ecuador, out to the Galapagos, across the Pacific, across the Indian, and across the Atlantic. It took me four years. Wow. Did you have to plan that out to know where you're going to stop, you know, for the different ports, that sort of thing? or? Well, not really. And, and you know, you just went to the next island. Um, the, here's the deal with the boats. You have two things you have to worry about. Which way the wind is blowing and when do the hurricanes come? So at the, around the equator in the tropics, the, the winds blow from east to west. So uh -huh. that's the direction you go. You go west. And the hurricanes are there, you know, in the summer and the late fall. So you don't want to be in the, in the water when the hurricanes are there. So otherwise, you can just go where you want. So you park the boat somewhere whenever it's hurricane season? No, I would leave the tropics. Oh, you so leave the instance, tropics. Okay. When I, was Pacific, when I was in the Pacific, I went down to New Zealand during the hurricane season. Nice, nice. Let me tell you, that was impressive. In all the stuff that I read about you when I saw the boat, I'm like, oh, this guy is also sort of a challenging kind of a guy. He likes to give himself a challenge. But I guess if you were a lobbyist in Alaska, why don't you tell me a little bit about that? All right. So I represented the, the environmental community in the state legislature there. So the, the, the organization was called the Alaska Environmental Lobby. And I ran that for a legislative session. And you know, Alaska is, is a conservative state, to put it mildly, and, and so it's a losing battle, right? So the, the battles are, how can you lose the least? <laughs> every, <laughs> every once in a while, you might want to win one, you might win one, and we won a tremendous battle when I was there, um, that, and part of that battle is in my book, Rins Crossing, right, just peripherally, but, um, but yeah. I learned a lot about politics and I learned about, about how to gum up the works and, and I learned that actually there are a lot of really good people in the legislature. Well, you know what is interesting? When, when, I, uh, when, when your publicist said he was a lobbyist, he's really deep into politics and he got things done, uh, my first thought was lobbyist and the first thing that come across with lobbyists is sort of on a negative. But in your case, you were lobbying for something good. So, I mean, uh, you were lobbying, I think, also for the environment, right? I lobbied for the Alaska environmental community in the state legislature. Okay, so as you said, I think that I was on the side of the angels for that. But I also want to say that I think I'm only, it was only partially of what I needed to lobby for. Because if you don't have, if we don't have a cultural consensus on, say, good, having the environment being clean and healthy, right? eventually the people will vote against us. So how is it that we get a cultural consensus? We have to develop a platform that, that speaks to a lot of different people, not just other environmentalists. And that was really my, my, my concern about being just an environmental lobbyist. That is profound, actually. Uh, you, you are likely the first environment i don't want to call you an environmentalist but somebody concerned about the environment that actually took that perspective in other words you're you're doing something that we talk about here at politics done right a lot and that is get in get in buy in based on your own person uh, the, the things that will ultimately interest you and that is what you have to get on and that is what gives these these things stay in power and permanence right yeah i agree and and it's you know how I mean, look what Donald Trump has done. He's pretty much wiped out everything that Obama did in eight years. Right. And the only thing that stops politicians from doing that, right, is when there's a consensus in the body politic among the people in the street that we need to keep those things. Right. So when Eisenhower came in as a Republican, all the Republicans wanted to get rid of Social Security. 
but by that time, Social Security was was um, supported by so many people, Eisenhower was smart enough not to fight that battle. So the question we have as environmentalists is how do we make an environmental message speak to you know Jane and Joe in the street? How do, how do we make an environmental message important to them? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so what I was gonna say is that, let's just take an example. So we stopped logging in the Pacific Northwest, and I think that was a good thing by using a, you know, the spotted owl, which is on an endangered species. So we stop all this logging for a little owl about this big, right? And where do you think all those loggers, who do you think all those loggers voted for in the next election? They didn't vote for our guy, right? And who do you think the neighbors of those loggers voted for in the next election? Because their neighbors are now out of work. Well, they didn't vote for our guy. And if we don't win elections, we lose everything, right? So, so my, my concern about the environmental community, or I'm actually my, one of my concerns about the left as a whole, is it's, it's balkanized. We have gay rights over here. We have Black Lives Matter over here. We have the environment over here, right, where we really need a unifying message. I need to ask you a question because I, I read the Green New Deal, and what I loved about the Green New Deal specifically is that the way it handled things is I think it looked at uh, the blueprint that you just gave is pretty much in there. In other words, it's trying to say, we're going to do this, but we're not going to lose the jobs. We're going to do this, and you're going to see it. Poor people and all these other people are going to see a benefit from having thought about the environment, whether it's within your homes, whether it is within the forest. All, all these things seem to and, – and, whoops. I'll come back. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It, you know, it seems – whoops, your camera again. I, you must be pushing a button or something. No, the, the, camera's, the camera's flaky and I have a, a webcam, but I didn't know I was going to be doing this interview. That's so I okay. Didn't, I didn't I, bring I, the webcam to me. That's right. I'm patient. It's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Let's just see when you get it back together. Okay, there you go. All right. Yeah. So, so as far as the Green New Deal is concerned, I would say that uh, that it, it took a lot of your concerns into account. Uh, am I right? Yes. Yes. We, again, the reason why the bad guys win is they're the only ones of an agenda that speaks to the people in the street. The Green New Deal and um, I don't know if you are aware of the Apollo Alliance, you know, the Blue Green Coalition. That is how we're going to be most effective is when we're speaking to a larger, larger segment of the community, except instead of just environmentalists. Help me out. I have not heard of the Blue Green Alliance. Well, so the blue, the blue, of course, are blue collared workers uh -huh. and the green, of course, are, are environmentalists. Yeah, okay, got it. Right. So, so often the, the greens and the, and the blue and the workers are against each other. Right. Like in Alaska, they have these multi-billion dollar rape and ruin projects but those bring, you know, those, those provide jobs, jobs, you know, for people who need jobs. And so we really need to think in that, in the kind of a broader sense. I like that. That is, that is actually, I mean, I, I think that is the message that we have to get out here. And this, this segment that we're doing here, I think it's in, informative to a lot of folks because um, when you talk about the balkanization and everybody having their own little silos that they act out of in the progressive movement, we, we've talked a lot on politics done right about, working together and and i think you've encapsulated quite well there anyhow kirkus review calls it a riveting page turner publisher weekly says it is suspenseful and it's a finalist in two international competitions are you surprised at the positive critical response to your it's a fairly new book rinse crossing yes so yeah it's my second novel and and my um and am I surprised? No, I'm certainly gratified. You know, I wrote this book because I wanted a book that was really well written, where we paid a lot of attention to character and the use of the prose. I mean, so much genre is, is pretty poor. And at the same time, had a ripping story. So a lot of literary fiction doesn't have a story, right? And I want to put the two together. I want to have a really good story and a really well-written novel. And so I spent a lot of time on it. And I, you know, I can see by the reviews that it's speaking to a lot of people. 
So I tell you what, give us a like, a, tell me a little bit about what the book is about. And then I'm, I'm going to want to tie that into your real based experience as a lobbyist. Okay, great. So it's about three, three friends in Alaska and they're bound together by their love of Alaska, but they all have a different vision of what Alaska should look like. And as the forces in the state start tearing the state apart, each of these three friends choose a different side and then they betray each other because it's more important to them that their vision of Alaska is, that their vision of Alaska holds. So for instance, one of the friends is an Alaska native and you know, there are a lot of Alaska natives, about 15% of the population. And some of the things that were promised them, this might surprise you, they never got, right? Oh, so really? The, <laughs> I, I knew like it the 40 acres and a mule that uh, the American black folk were promised? <laughs> so, so, the, uh, so one of the things that were, they were promised back when their land claims were settled in 1971 was that they would have a preference for subsistence resources, so, you know, so hunting, fishing, gathering. So they would have a native preference and that has never been realized in Alaska. It's now what, 40 years later, 50 years later now. So one of the, but that, it's called the subsistence amendment because they have to amend the state constitution. But that amendment, which the natives support, right? conflicts with people who say, wait a minute, we're all Americans. Why should you guys have special rights? Okay. And when the natives get um, a lot of their land allotments, what they do, of course, is they exploit the resources. <laughs> so the natives are the biggest clear cutters and loggers in Alaska. Right. So then you have the environmentalists over here who don't want the forest cut. And you can see it's a fight. The and that's what the novel's about. Novel's yeah. about and now you said they were, but I think you said there were three conflicts at three different directions. So one of the directions, the native who wants control, the other direction, the, uh, the environmentalist. What's the third? Uh, well, the third is an old environmentalist who's given up. He's a nihilist in the sense that, that he just realizes the attack on Alaska is relentless and there's nothing he can do. So he commits a crime. He sabotages a native corporation logging camp, and his sweetie, who's the environmentalist, gets charged with his crime. Right. So he's got to figure out how to get her off the hook without ending up in jail himself. But uh, interesting, and I imagine there's a whole lot of intrigue around that, that, you, that if you want to get it, folks, get the book, Rance Crossan. <laughs> But <laughs> now you, you, you set this book in Alaska. Do you live in Alaska right now or do you, have you moved on? No, um, I, I, can you see out there? That's I'm in beautiful. The, I'm in the backwoods of Maine. I'm living in a little log cabin. Here's my wood stove. Oh, um, that's, whoa. Is, and that's your real home. That's my real home. And, and so, so I left Alaska in 2010 because I wanted to live in a big city. I wanted more frenzy in my life. And, and you know, Juno's only 30,000 people. And, right. and um, there's a lot going on for 30,000 people, but there's a lot more going on in New York City. So I lived in, in New York City for a while and then I couldn't get a job. So I retreated to, to this cabin here on the coast of Maine. I've been here for five years. And, wow. So, but you know, I mean, there's a sort of a, a, con a, a similarity between that and Alaska in the summer, I guess. Well, it gets cold here in the winter, too. Well, that's true. That's true. You're out, out there kind of pretty, pretty north, north in Maine. Now, so what, what, again, what made you choose Alaska as the, uh, as the place where you wanted to have this adventure? I mean, I, you know, people who think of big adventures and intrigues, I don't know that they really think that Alaska is the place, you know? Ah, uh, what are they missing? What are they missing? <laughs> so, so... Um, well, first of all, I love Alaska. I hitchhiked up there when I was, when I was a teenager in 1974, ended up working on the pipeline as well as the, uh, you know, as the legislature. And Alaska is an extraordinary place. It is truly, truly an extraordinary place. You, you, you know, the, the thing is that most of us were fighting for comfort, convenience, and safety. Those are the three things we want. We want everything easy and we want to be safe. And when, when that happens, when, when you have comfort, convenience, and safety, life is a little boring. 
there's no challenge, there's no risk, there's no, there's no threat. And the, the joy and love of living in Alaska is that it's a challenge. It's a challenge to survive at 40 below. It's a challenge to climb those big mountains, right? And it's truly all inspiring the beauty. So it's, it's an, in, in Alaska, unlike other places, it really kind of molds a person's character. Who you are changes because you live in Alaska. And Alaskans get really ideological about what they want Alaska to be. And, and by ideological, I mean they get really committed to a certain vision that they have of Alaska. And it's this, it's this vision, this competing vision that different people, different Alaskans have that really drives the story. So I wanted it set in Alaska because of the challenge and the adventure, the exoticness of it, but because, you know, people, people get upset. They have conflicts. They fight over what they want Alaska to be. Now, you had to do a whole lot of research on this book. And again, you were a lobbyist. So you kind of uh, roam the capital in, where is it? Juneau, I think is the capital, right? Exactly. Yeah. In, in, in Juneau. So you kind of know how things happen. Did, did, your, did you have to do much research or was it enough that you knew how the political machine actually works on the state level? So both. So both. So, so one of the driving forces through the book, I haven't really talked about it, is a package of bills that will give the natives what they want, the subsistence amendment, right? And that's what the left wants. And then a package of bills that the right wants, right? And for the, the left to get what they want and the right to get what they want, the whole thing has to pass, all right? So it's this big sausage, big, big compromise. And um, so one, I knew a lot about how the legislature worked, but also when I was a lobbyist, I'm a really good listener, like, like you are, really good listener. And I'd sit around with these legislators and they would tell me stories thinking that it would never get into print. So every dirty trick, every manipulation <laughs> in the book, except the very last one, Right. <laughs> happened in Alaskan history. And, and I'll tell you, there are a lot of people that are, are probably very thankful that I changed some names. That's what I, that was the next question that I was going to ask. Did you kind of protect these folks that you may, you, you don't want them to have a hit on you or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even, even some of the very, um, well, there's some legislators, you know, now long retired who might read this book and say, oh, that's what happened to my bill. Because some of the dirty tricks are my own. Oh, and, and they're real. Oh, absolutely. So a lot absolutely. of your book actually has some real incidents with enough of a fictional base to eh, make it kind of dubious. Well, to hide the, hide the, the culprits, yes. To hide the culprits. Now, um, is love, in your book, according to what, what, you, what I understand you have in there, is a lot of people think that lobbying is corrupt but you think that it's not necessarily so in neither direction, actually, based on the characters. Well, it's perspective. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think politicians get a bad rap. Really? So oh, absolutely. And, and lobbyists. So politics is, is the process by which we, we work out our different values and our different interests. And it's essential in a, in a social, you know, social animals. It's essential. Okay. So, I mean, you go into wolf pack and it's the biggest and the baddest that determines what happens. Right. But in, in humans, you got to have politics. And so I think politics are, um, you know, politicians are providing a really, a really good service, you know, when politics is done right. And it often looks from afar as if it's corrupt because people are, are fighting over their interests and, you know, it's self-interest, but that's okay. That's okay. You know, the, Hang on one sec. The mm -hmm. only community, the only human community that doesn't have politics, it's a graveyard. <laughs> Actually, you know what? That's true. But I want to I want to frame the question a bit differently. I still I, I think I disagree with you when you say, uh, you know, politicians get a bad rap. I think before Citizens United, that may have been true. OK, before mm -hmm. uh, Buckley, Buckley Vallejo, I think that would have been right. But I think that politics no longer involve all the true, uh, what do you call, call, what do you call that person that has a stake, stakeholders. I think at this current time, 
politics doesn't involve all the stakeholders. And in that case, I think it defies what you just said as far as it's how we make the sausage because a lot of parts of the sausage makers aren't there. Well, I would say that, that that's not the fault of the politicians, it's fault of the system, the system in which we play the game of politics. Question, question, let me, let me I, I, because I think you're right. Yep. No, question. Uh, it's a part of, is it the system or is it the audience? Meaning, is it that we, the, the everyday voter, have given up our, or, or not done our duty, our one vote really matters? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Ultimately, the responsibility lies with us, right? And, you know, again, it comes back to if, if you want to win, again, I'll, I'll just use the environmentalists as an example. So a lot of environmental victories happen in the court system. And so, and they almost always happen over little nits of administrative law, right? So you have this decision, like this big dam is, is, is not allowed to go forward because of some little fish called a snail darter. The most personal people in the street say, that's crazy. This is a multi-billion dam that's going to you know, create megawatts of electricity for a bloody snail darter. Who cares about a snail darter? So if you have your battles in a courtroom, you don't bring the people along with you. And if you don't bring the people along with you, they're not going to vote for you. And if you don't vote for you, you get Donald Trump. So, so the deal is, in the, you know, for the left, certainly the environmental community, but I'm not going to limit it to the environmental community, too much of our work has left the streets. We need to be back on the streets, knocking on doors and working with people. I mean, the whole, the, the whole grievance vote that Donald Trump got, you know, all those, you know, whites who were calling racist, which, you know, you're never going to get them to vote for you if you're calling them a racist. Mm -hmm. Though all those people should have been on our side. Those are people we need to be working. You know, they're, they're, they're suffering from the loss of jobs and rusted out communities. They've got drug addictions. You know, their life expectancy is going down. Those are the people on the left that we should be dealing with, but we've lost them. And we've and lost them. Listen to my show yesterday. That's what we talk about. Me talking about going to the right and talking to my, my, white, my right brothers and sisters. You know, I have this phrase that I tell folks all the time. Oh, some of my best friends are racist. And they, people get it back and they're, what do you mean? And I'm like, look, uh, I can actually talk to these folks and I can actually inform these folks. I'm a little bit concerned of those of faith because that one is a higher thing to crack if mm -hmm. their faith is causing them to have some values that affect what we think is best for us all. Thoughts on that, I'm curious. Well, I think, I think the word racist right now is, is used in a way that's very divisive. Mm -hmm. You know, our ultimate goal is to bring people together, not yes. split them apart. And yeah, there's some really nasty things that are going on um, to you know, people of color, but but just take, for example, say you're a white boy growing up in a mobile home in Appalachia, your dad's gone, your mother's strung out on opioids, and you were weaned on Mountain Dew. What does white patriarchy mean to him? Zippo. That's, right? that's the battle. But if we call him a racist and we call him a white patriarchal, we've lost him. Right. We should be in there in, on his side, right? Because he's not living a life of justice in, in, any, in any respect. Russell, so you know, Russell, that is so, such an important concept that you put out there. There, there are a couple of writers that have talked about that where, where they say, but if I put that, uh, that guy in a suit and I go in a suit for a job, he still has a better opportunity than I do. But you have to try to form that in a frame that takes his pain into consideration. Always talk about the gradation of pain. Right. When right. you talk about the gradation of pain, it's a losing battle to do that, right? I can forget. What, and the reason I use the concept when I talk about racists are my friends and that sort of stuff, the reason I use that concept is because what I want to prove is I use that, and people get mad at me for saying that, but I use it as an attribute. In other words, uh, being fat averse is also an attribute that some people have. Being right. What, you know, there are so many things that, 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 that's there. So I think it's important that, that what you just mentioned is it's important for people to understand. It's important for the left to understand how they're going to really uh, win over people. I have this other phrase that I use whenever we unite Appalachia, the ghettos and the barrios. It's yeah. very, it's very uh, stereotypical, right? But it's the truth, isn't it? 
the barrios, the ghettos, and Appalachia has more in common than me and Donald Trump, right? And so it comes back to your question about, you know, the system in which we're working. In a way, I think that the left, again, bolderized, you know, balkanized, we've divided ourselves. So we've lost our nat some of our natural constituency, which put Donald Trump in power. Right. Right. And, and also, you know, the people, you know, the people with money and corporate power, there are not many of them. But if we divide us, they can conquer. And then we get, you know, the, you know, we get these crazy uh, election laws and money counts as free speech. And, and pretty soon you can't compete anymore because you don't have a billion dollars. That is absolutely true. Russell, uh, before we get out of here, uh, tell me something that you had wished I had asked you that in my <laughs> lack of wisdom, I did not. First of all, great interview. I really enjoyed work, uh, being here with you and, and, and getting me all excited. So what you didn't ask me is, what are some of my dirty tricks? What, were some what are some tricks? of your dirty tricks, Russell? All right. Well, I can't tell you because I, I will give it away. Again, the book's <laughs> Rins Crossing, and I don't want to give away any of the dirty tricks that I played in the book, but there's several there that were mine. But I'll tell you one that I couldn't squeeze in. Okay. All right. So really quick here. The... It was towards the end of the legislative session, and I discovered on a Friday that the, the uh, Senate Resources Committee was going to hear a pro-mining bill, all right? So that meant that I would have to spend the entire weekend organizing, calling people up to get them to come and testify against the bill. Now, understand that we could never win. All we can do is make it less bad, all right? And here's the kicker. Southeast Alaska is a rainforest. It rains there all the time. And this weekend, there are not going to be any clouds in the sky. And you don't understand that Southeast Alaskans will kill their kittens. They'll sacrifice their kittens to get outside on a, on a beautiful day. All right. So here I was Friday afternoon thinking, oh, my God, I have to spend my whole weekend calling people to get them to testify against this bill, which wouldn't do a damn thing anyway. So I said, I'm not going to play by the rules. So I called up a friend in the, the Senate Minority Leaders, a Democrat, Senate Minority Leaders office and said, you know, Rosemary, I'm, I'm thinking of like running into that committee room on Monday and dumping a, a pail of dead fish on the committee table. <laughs> and the, there had just been this big fish kill in, this, in the creek that the mine was right on. So everybody, you know, it would have been very appropriate. And she goes, oh. So I hang up and she goes, tells her boss, you know, the senator, minority leader, says, Jim, the greenies are going to dump a pile of, of dead fish on the committee table, you know, in House and Senate resources on Monday. And Jim, Senator Duncan, calls up the chair of the committee, who's Republican, Mike Miller, and says, oh, you wouldn't believe what the greenies are going to do. And Mike Miller panicked. He canceled the meeting and he called the state troopers. And I played all weekend <laughs> in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> that was a dirty trick, and it played out just right for you, man. It did. It hey, did. tell us uh, uh, how folks can uh, find your website, your book, all that good stuff, so that we can uh, get, get it to you, man. All right. So I really encourage folks to read this book. This is really exciting. You will not be able to put it down, and it's very unique. There's, there's not another legislative thriller that I know of, and this legislative thriller is like a police procedural It'll take you through the legislative process, and it's exciting. It is not boring. So, Rins Crossing, you can Google Rins Crossing, Russell Heath, and I will pop right up. My website is russellheathauthor.net. Of course, the book's on Amazon. And if you read it, send me a note. I really like to know what you think. And um, particularly about the moral quandaries, because, you know, the most difficult fights are rights versus rights. You know, it's not good versus equal, evil. Mm -hmm. It's when you have two rights, two mm -hmm. goods fighting each other. And that's what I have in the novel. Russell Heath, I must say I enjoyed this interview. I also really love your perspective. I can't, I, I, I hope you keep doing what you do. And, and you know, I think uh, uh, you're out there in Maine. You may have to jump down here and, and get involved a bit more active with a lot of that advice that you have, folk. I mean, I tell you, that is, 
that is some some good words. My name is Egberto Willis. I want to thank Russell Heath for having been with Politics Done Right. Have a great day. Hey, thanks, Egberto. Ciao. I'm Egberto Willis, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much. Thank you.